Um, so hi, welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Rian. I head up the product side here at Jelly, and very excited to have Dane here. Um, he uh, wrote a po post that I'm guessing a bunch of you read already, and that's why you're here. Uh, if not, we're going to talk through it. So Dane uh, is a technical architect at Ithaca, which I think I said correctly. Um, and Dane, maybe you can do an intro on yourself and, and a little bit of your background, and then we'll get started. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rian. Um... I, so as you mentioned, I'm a technical architect here at Ithaca. Um, my focus is mainly on the JSTOR product platform. Uh, so I work with a number of our UI engineering folks um, building the JSTOR experience. Uh, and I've been here for about nine years uh, doing mostly web development during that time. Um, and uh, over the past couple of years have been kind of in the incident management and learning from incidents space here as well. Cool, that's awesome. So how this is going to work, just so everyone knows, I'm going to just ask if uh, stay a few questions, and we're going to chat about stuff. And um, but the chat is open. If you have questions or want to interrupt us with anything through voice, feel please feel free to do that. Um, but as a start, Dan, I think what was interesting about your post, you start a little bit in talking about how incident management has evolved from initial concepts like blameless cultures and postmortems to us using very different terms these days. And it's kind of evolved, the industry itself has evolved over time. Can you talk a little bit about how you see that and, and how that has influenced your work? Yeah, um, how I how I kind of see this is that blameless culture really is sort of the the baseline of everything like it, it's it's a necessary foundation i think for for everything and organizations that uh maybe matured out of a blameful culture into a blameless one i think really know and appreciate the the value of blameless culture over a blameless mm -hmm. uh, blameful one but um it, it <laughs> I think it can start to grow if you've if you've gotten to that baseline or started with that baseline of a blameless culture. It can also grow eventually into like a an ownerless culture almost, or there's there's like no blame, no owners, everything's kind of passive, and uh, ultimately you're not really you're not really in a space of learning and taking action and improving over time. So it, it can fall almost out of the continuous improvement spirit that it was meant to foster originally. And so the, the point instead, I think, is the the deep learning and the building intuition about systems and building institutional memory about those systems. Um, and, and again, kind of accountably taking action to improve those over time. So I feel like that's been the shift I've seen, uh, yeah. especially with, with language and um, recognizing and emphasizing the importance of the learning aspect of things. So in your experience with that, what what is a way to do that without people feeling on defense or something like that? If you are going to say, well, accountability is still important, what are some ways we do that in in this work? Yeah, I think the the one of one of the reasons we we talk about blameless culture is uh, that we want to ask how and not why. We don't want to ask like who who did this, why did you do this, uh, but I think. If we ask, if we ask the who question, kind of at the end about the actions um, mm. and the, the next steps, like who can take this forward, who can own this, who's, mm. who's willing to engage with um, improving the the thing for the next step, I think that's quite a bit different attitude than who did the thing that broke the system or or something like that, right? So, yeah. um, it, it's not that we want to steer away from people, we still want people to be an integral part of the process, right? And it's just finding the right time to, the right time in the right context to um, have a specific owner for, for things, so. Yeah, so I wanna take that and move us a little bit closer to how you all are doing this. Uh, one of the things that was interesting to me is these different learning zones that you talk about, Tom Seniger's learning zone model. Can you talk a little bit about each of the different zones before we dig into that and how that has influenced your thinking about how you do incident management at Ithaca? Yeah, so for those that aren't familiar, the learning zone model kind of splits in any given situation, uh, it splits the state of operation that you might be under into kind of three different groups. Um, 
the the comfort zone is kind of the most familiar one I think for people uh, and is is often where you spend a lot of your time I think on your day to day work and things um, you'll spend a good portion of your time in the comfort zone uh, but then the learning zone model has two additional ones uh, the panic zone is kind of the the opposite of the comfort zone and that's where uh, you know people would feel like their hair is on fire or um, they're under the you know under the gun or up on the on the wire to uh to deliver and um panic and anxiety and and those kinds of feelings crop up and everything mm. feels urgent and important um so then there's this kind of realm in the middle of those two that is the learning zone and really that is the sweet spot because uh there you there you will kind of find that you have an eagerness to learn and things might be uncomfortable or unfamiliar, but you feel kind of safe to explore, look around, ask questions, be curious. Um, and I really think that's where a majority of growth happens, um, both at an individual level, at an organizational level, uh, learning from, from incidents. So really um, it, it's, it's important, I guess, to find the processes and the questions and the way of treating incidents um, and thinking about systems in a way that fosters people being in that zone. Because if you push too far into the panic zone, people will kind of shy away and, and be scared of, of um, what's, what might happen to them if they engage or, or are pegged as the person responsible. Um, yeah. And if you're too far into the comfort zone most of the time, um, you know, it, there can be apathy or like a bystander effect um, mm. and um, maybe folks don't feel there's anything to learn uh, about a given situation so um, that's that's really where like like if you think of it as a normal curve you want the big chunk of the normal curve to be spent in the yeah in the zone, ideally it feels like sometimes what happens is you don't when you're in the moment, you don't know what zone you're in. <laughs> so you might be in the comfort zone where, and you're not even aware of that. What are some of the signs that, that you found that you spend too much time either in the panic zone or in the comfort zone? Um, and, and what can you do about those things when you, know, when you notice it? Yeah, I mean, I would say that if you feel like you have too much time in the panic zone, it might be the case that you haven't even achieved a, a blameless culture, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if people feel like they might get punished or have to deal with some kind of fallout from speaking up or, you know, shoot the messenger type of type of culture, um, that's that's not a good foundation to build off of. Um, and so I think you'll see people really kind of avoiding speaking up. Um, also, even because there just may not be a culture of communication at that point, even if there isn't punishment or retaliation, if people just aren't, um, you know, used to communicating regularly and openly together, mm -hmm. um, you, you might see kind of silence a lot of the time. Um, and then I think you might over time see that each time something goes even a little bit wrong, pe people start to kind of crank up the fear and anxiety and, and start to feel uncomfortable even when something is fairly low stakes. So it actually mm. ends up amplifying the panic, um, even for things that definitely aren't worth panicking over. Yeah, yeah. And what about the comfort zone side of things? How um, how do you know you're too, spending too much time there? Yeah, um, I mentioned kind of the bystander effect. I think that if you if you just kind of feel like, oh, everything's good, it'll all work out eventually, uh, it doesn't need to, we don't need to worry about this right now. Uh, things can kind of be swept under the rug and fall by the wayside. And um, if if you really want people to engage and feel, you know, proud of their work and proud of continuous improvement and um, even just not wanting to experience a particular incident a second time, um, you really want to kind of get out of just feeling like you're doing it for its own sake. Um, and, and I think uh, if you kind of survey people and, and find out that they feel like the incident review process is just kind of checking a bunch of boxes or, uh, you know, pantomiming uh, the, yeah. the process uh, and that they might be bored some of the time, 
um, that that's maybe a sign that you're kind of sitting in the comfort zone too often. Yeah. So I, I, I know that at Ithaca, you have a specific handoff process from responders to investigators um, to enable team members to flow into that learning zone. Can you walk us through that and what that actually looks like? Yeah. Uh, the And to, I guess for clarity, some of those people are the same people. There's, there's overlap in those groups for sure. Um, but I, I think one of the most important things that we do is that we have a pretty clear separation between the incident process itself, the, the mitigation and the responder process and the review process. So when we, when we mitigate an incident and kind of feel that the impact is over, whatever it may have been, we kind of stop there and let things, let things digest and mingle. Um, and it, we leave kind of the follow-up questions and the, geez, how did this happen? Kind of, kind of feelings, uh, and wait until the review. And mm. uh, at least in my experience, it, there's not a bunch of side channel, back channel talk about like, oh, geez, what, what are we going to say about this? Or how did, how did this come to be? So, uh, I think people are really good about kind of waiting and asking those questions publicly and, uh, importantly, like in the context of what people were thinking and um what what the what the thought process was as the incident was unfolding uh because I, I think the assumption right is that everyone did the best they could with what they knew at the time um and, and so really framing questions with that baseline that context i think is really important um yeah as a as a separation because if you start to ask those questions right afterward people are already naturally in that kind of defensive mode and mm. Um, even if it's a perfectly good question to ask, the response might be kind of like, well, of course, this is what I did, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so just it's clearly people, separating well, those phases between we're in response mode versus we're in learning mode now. Yeah, just like taking a deep breath and and um, giving people the opportunity to, to rest, really, before yeah, work. Yeah, yeah moving to the next thing. Yeah. There's a couple of relevant questions from chat here that I want to ask about. Uh, one, uh, Emily asks, what have you tried to help reveal to folks who might not be aware of which zone their org is sitting in? So how do you communicate to an org, you're in the panic zone without them getting defensive about that, for example? Um, have you have you experienced some of that? I don't know that I've had the opportunity, I guess, to, to meet that challenge. Uh, I, I've mostly experienced the incident process here at Ithaca. Um, mm. I do think much like any feedback, it's that that kind of thing is probably best delivered as a standalone separate conversation from a particular incident. Mm. You know, if you've just had an incident, you, that's probably not the time to not the right say, time. Hey, you're in the panic mode, you know? Yeah, I think saying saying you know i've seen some challenges with the incident review process i think this is the impact that it's having uh -huh. uh, might we take some time to discuss how we could get better results and ultimately have fewer incidents over time ideally um, by by shifting how we do things um, that'd be that'd be my tactic anyway so, so basic good human communication <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael asks, how do you report on incidents at a team or department level without incentivizing folks to avoid creating incidents unless everything is on fire? So how do you make sure that people are comfortable with being in the learning zone all the time? Um, do you have thoughts on that? Like, how do you encourage people that incidents are fine? Like, we should be creating them and learning from them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think... A really important piece is to thank people and praise people for sharing. Um, I think that there's a, a really big opportunity in all of this for positive reinforcement. Um, I think that's another way kind of like blameless culture is like a neutral stance. Uh, blameful culture is a negative stance. You really want to move even further into the positive stance and say, wow. you know, I really appreciated that you were brave enough, had the courage to to say, you, you know, that something went wrong, especially since yeah. 
you know, you deployed the code that did it or, you know, mm. just offer people like, even though you were involved and even though you might feel you were part of the problem, um, it's great that you took the initiative, great that you felt safe enough to share. Um, and if if you can do that in public forums as well, so that everyone can see like, oh, this is really something people appreciate and that I should be doing and I want to model that success. So yeah uh, normalizing the experience yeah yeah it's culture work for sure yeah yeah it won't that's not the kind of thing you can do in a, a day or a week or a month i don't think i mean that's that takes yeah yeah time. emily says here it's a lot of socializing the message over and over and positive reinforcement yeah yeah that's a great call out um there's another question here do you find that the zones are work specific or can they teams be in different zones for different types of incidents or maybe they're usually in learning but a new something happens that actually throws them into panic without them even realizing it is it is it at a team base or a different uh, org base how do how do you see these things people moving between these zones yeah i think i think it's a zone that or I th sorry i think it's a model that mm. can scale to any of those levels right it can go all the way down to an individual uh, and is often how I, I think about it at the individual level, uh, but can certainly flow up to the org too. Um, one thing that I could see happening is that if you do have an incident of the same flavor too many times, even though that could be something you might want to learn from and stop from happening again, you might have everyone falling into the comfort zone. They're like, yep, prod's down again in this way. Yeah. Uh, we'll just push the button that fixes it again, and uh, so you you have these you have these patterns that you can fall into over time, and those are the kinds of those are the kinds of ruts that you really want to be able to get out of. And um, the first step is is recognizing those. So um, I th I find it's been a helpful model to say, you know, is is there someone who's sitting in one of these three rings that they. Mm. They shouldn't so is be. this is this the the language of this model language that everyone internally at Ithaca is aware of, and you're able to say, "Hey, let's get out of the panic zone," and everyone knows what that means, or is there still a lot of socializing on that needed as well? Uh, this this is something that mainly I have I have used myself, so it isn't something that we are are using in a in a truly standard way, but um, I, I think. You, even even just now you've prompted me <laughs> maybe i yeah, should yeah. be socializing that more right yeah uh, part of but this part of the common language around how we talk about things and again that might remove some of the defensiveness from it right in saying like no this is the thing we're in and we're all agreed on we don't want to be in here yeah and i i think people do express that same sentiment in different ways um with with similar effect and um yeah i don't i'm not of the mind to force everyone into particular terminology unless it's you know for clarity purposes and, and so yeah on. um yeah models are helpful and sometimes they're right you know <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes they're not i was just thinking about it because in this case it might actually remove some of the um the, the dangers of this some of the areas where people might feel unsafe or they feel like they're going to get blamed if if you if you talk about it almost at an abstract level no we, we're in the panic zone right now that anchors everyone and, and helps them move towards a different zone yeah. um sort of related to that michael has another good question here how do you change the mindset of an, an incident analysis an opportunity analysis is extra work versus no this is actually a good thing it's a positive learning experience it's a good thing for us to do this have you had that challenge there and, and how do you help people understand that that the work afterwards isn't extra work for extra points. It's actually part of the process. Yeah, also a really good question. Um, I think at Ithaca, at least, we're blessed to have just a massive amount of curious people. So it, it's always been easy enough from that perspective, I think, to, to engage folks on, hey, do you know anything about this system that you've never mm. used before? Would you like to? Um, mm. And and that part's been okay. Um, I I think another way to sell that is by thinking about your new hires, for example. 
um, they probably don't know anything um, by the time they go to their first learning review. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're having a good cadence of learning reviews, like they'll probably have one within the first couple of weeks they're there. Uh, that's a great way to just kind of show them the culture so that mm -hmm. they know when something goes wrong. Uh, they, they don't have to be afraid. Uh, it's also uh, showing them some of the larger picture of the system that they're working within um, and just giving them an opportunity to see how other people think through problems too. Mm. I, I think it pays dividends in multiple ways. Um, mm. And it doesn't just have to be new hires. It can be, you know, teams just changed or your team took on uh, a new part of a system after redrawing some, some ownership lines, mm. like any, any time there's that flux of, um, ownership or shared understanding. I think it's yeah. a good opportunity to. That's actually know. a good follow-up question that I've been thinking about. You don't see uh, incident management often as part of onboarding for all engineers, um, and I'm wondering if that's something you all did or do, uh, like as part of onboarding any new engineering hire. Here's how incident management works. Here, is that something you all do? Um, yeah, it absolutely is. We have uh, a central document kind of called Incident Management at Ithaca uh, that explains the roles, how the incidents unfold, um, who who they should expect to be doing different things, what the thresholds are for different incidents. If the you know security incident has a different flavor than uh, just a, a normal outage, um, we also talk to them about alerting and monitoring, um, tooling and how to interpret some of that data and uh it's a it's a pretty integrated part of our onboarding process okay yeah that's cool we have an internal rule i think it's fisher's rule that if anyone mentions is this an incident uh there's a slack bot that says if there's if you're wondering if it is it is you should declare one right now <laughs> you could probably uh afford to do that more strongly too that's a yeah. good one um, but speaking of that, I'd love to move a little bit into how you all specifically do it and talk about um, how how Jelly has helped with this specific. You talk about an incident fingerprint. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how Jelly is involved? You 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 already have a good culture around learning from incidents. Can you talk about how Jelly fits into that and how you've actually used the product and how do you use the product right now? Sure. Um, so. Even before Jelly, we would fill out an incident timeline. Um, it, it used to be sort of a, a you know, Google Doc with a table in it, and you would type your things in, and it worked pretty well. Um, I think we suffered from not necessarily knowing, or not necessarily at a glance being able to see, okay, what was the actual shape of this thing? Um, we could certainly read a chronological ordering of events, but uh, we never we never abstracted that up a level, I guess, um, except in conversation in reviews. Um, so one way that uh, that jelly that we use jelly um, for that is in that timeline view. Um, I'm looking to share my screen here. Yeah, we'd love to see. So. Uh, here we go. Um, should be able to see. Yeah, this guy here. Um, so, uh, you know, this is this is a timeline for a particular incident. Um, we had a Slack webhook URL out in the wild. Slack rotated our webhook for us automatically. Uh, some stuff that used that webhook broke. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, that's a pretty small, small incident, I guess, in the scheme of things, but we still held a learning review about it. Um, what's, what's useful to know here, I think, or easy to, easy to see and, and nice to know is that we detected this pretty late at night. Hmm. There was diagnosis done pretty late at night. There's a big gap before more stuff happens. So you can kind of tell things like, I, I saw that there was an issue with the Slack webhook. I deemed that it wasn't important enough to lose sleep over and mm. attacked it the next morning. Um, 
you know, I think that kind of stuff is really interesting mm -hmm. and can easily be lost if you're just looking at walls of text about about the incident and so on. So, um, you know, that that timeline view, I think, is something that we try to make sure is reflective of of the incident. And then to the point of abstracting things up a level, um, using the markers in the timeline to express you know not only what kind of activity it was but the opportunity to summarize that into a useful um a useful summary um, yeah. and and i think it's important here to note like this this should work in my in my experience should work the same way you would treat code comments like don't put a summary here that just repeats what people were doing mm. um, in that diagnosis or that repair um kind of kind of summarize for someone who doesn't have as much context he, here's roughly what people were thinking about and what was being done um, yeah minus all the detail of of uh implementation and so on so yeah uh, it really helps people acclimate uh especially if you wanted to get people to read some of the history of your your incidents and build some institutional memory um, yeah you don't want and I love this example because it's all around the people. Like the insights you get from here is, oh, yes, there was this gap from 2 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then you can say, was that the right call or not? How did they decide that that, that was okay? Um, you probably can't tell us, but it would be interesting to learn. Like, what did you learn from that? And did you make any changes based on that? Um, would be would be interesting to hear about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I might I might go to this takeaways section mm. here, which um like we learned or at least some some of us learned that slack actually scans for webhook urls and if it sees them it automatically invalidates them that's pretty mm. nice of them um the uh the the notification i guess of that happening uh goes to the slack admins for your workspace and to the person who created the webhook also. Mm -hmm. um, we understand a little more about what happens when bad things happen with Slack. Mm -hmm. um, the webhook configurations that we have might be buried in weird places that aren't just something you can do in a code search alone. Um, maybe we want to do more configuration as code if we can, so that we can find those more readily. Um, so, you know, this, this could have been just seen as like, oh, we got to fix our configuration and now we're, we fixed it, so we're done. Yeah. I really appreciated this conversation because I think, um, you know, if we were to build systems that needed to work similar to, similarly to these, we might take some inspiration from how this works or uh, mm -hmm. learn some things not to do. And uh, anyone using Slack for automation might, you know, think twice about particular ways of of setting things up in the future. Um, it just has a lot of different routes you can kind of go down and discuss and think about. Um, and often the the kind of discussion about these things doesn't really end at the review, which I love. Like I love when the review keeps going outside mm -hmm. the room and people are like, you know, I I had more thoughts about this after I mm -hmm. slept. Um, I mean, that kind of stuff is just just awesome so yeah i was gonna ask about that what happens after the review who do you share this with are people interested have you seen changes in how interested people are based on on some of the ways that you use jelly or create these reports for them yeah i think that again the the abstraction and the ability to delve into the detail incrementally uh has helped a lot in being able to share these as the as the, you know, atom of, of communication uh, around incidents. So, being able to centralize um, the discussion and um, share this as, oh, if you want to know more about what happened, here's a good entry point. Um, I think I think that kind of practice has value, um, and. You know, we aren't we aren't using the reports um, mechanism as much currently. Uh, we do have a dedicated incidents channel that many people are subscribed to, so that any new incident and any updates on them that come through um, are something that they have eyes on. Um, mm -hmm. Prior to that, we had 
inc like the incident channel for each incident was the place to to learn about stuff and stay updated and so of course we had people in there who didn't need to know 99 percent of the information um, yeah and i think they probably felt overwhelmed and again it can push you into the panic zone like oh the the president's mm -hmm. in the yeah uh, <laughs> right you know, yeah so um being able I to quickly stratify levels. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, like being able to stratify those communication levels, I think is is an important yeah. practice. How do you typically decide who runs a learning review and and who attends those and how are they structured? Yeah, so we have a dedicated team of incident review facilitators, uh, learning review facilitators. Um, that's about five people at the moment. Um, and again, I've I've been working on that group or that team for a couple of years. We have a couple newer people, um, so we just have a, a pager duty rotation basically. Uh, and so, anytime an incident has finished and someone needs someone to facilitate a review, they'll just page that rotation, mm -hmm. and whoever's whoever's on call will respond. Um, the there was a second part to your question. Sorry, what was it? Uh, who attends the review and, and how are they how are they generally run? Um, we try to encourage as many people as possible to attend. Uh, we don't even try to put limits on it being engineering or anything like that. Um, product managers occasionally attend. Um, we also recently kind of changed our, our language to back to the point of language being important and, and culture being important. Um, we, we started calling them learning reviews mm. instead of blameless postmortems, uh, just to really emphasize the, the point, the reason we're doing any of this is to learn from what happened and be able to, to improve for next time. So if you want to learn something, show up, um, it's, yeah. it's kind of, the, kind of the spirit of it. And, um, some of our, some of our bigger, um, incidents, I think I've had something like a third of the company show wow. up. Um, some, some are quite a bit more niche and, uh, you know, correspondingly have fewer attendees, but, uh, I think, I think I've, we've never had less than say 40 attendees to a learning review, um, no matter how. That's small. amazing. That's, that's a lot of participation. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you do a review, a learning review for every incident, or do you have a mechanism for deciding which ones should have a review versus which ones are okay? That's a really good question. Uh we we really have mostly tended to call incidents for sort of those severity one things. Mm. Uh, I think we're trying to explore the the boundaries and the impacts of calling incidents for for less of your things and um you know we'd really like to be able to find that point that's sort of too much too much overhead i guess mm -hmm. um and there there's some kind of like return on investment curve there i imagine yeah and it's it's probably invisible but um I think exploring that in any organization is probably an important part of of understanding because um, if you if you have a learning review for everything, no matter what, I think that falls into kind of like checking the boxes and mm -hmm. running through the process rote. Um, that said, we don't have too much of a process around should we or should we not have a learning review right now just because everything is kind of those severity one things that we know we do want to learn from yeah um, but we have talked about that that prospect so so you you use the the uh jelly bot only for the sev ones um at the moment is that right is that what you're saying yeah maybe with a couple of exceptions yeah Okay. And how is broadcast channel, how are broadcast channels used there? Who's, who's, how do you communicate status updates uh, on that? Is it, it, are there, you mentioned a channel that everyone is in, is that where you communicate status updates via the bot? Yeah, um, that is, that is the main place that folks go. Um, we do have a status page 
integration also um, to, to communicate to folks mm -hmm. who probably aren't following those things. Um, and so that at any time you can have kind of a static snapshot of the status. Um, I think it, especially with bigger incidents or longer running incidents, you have kind of this rolling status over time. Yeah. Uh, times you just want to know what's the status right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. status page can be good for that. Um, and we use um, currently the the status um, proper in in the jelly opportunity mm -hmm. to communicate those things yeah. or in the jelly incident rather. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask one last question before I see if there's any any Q and A, and that's around. So when uh, at Jelly we see customers in all levels and journey on their on their learning from incidents journey, and I was wondering what recommendations you have for teams who are just getting started on that journey. Maybe they they're not they're not at blameless yet even, or they don't do any reviews or things like that. What are some ways that you can start moving teams and organizations towards more of a learning from incidents approach to these things? Biggest thing, I, I anticipated this might kind of come up in, in the biggest thing I thought of um, earlier today was that really everything, everything is a cost, incidents cost us. And mm -hmm. the thing is that once an incident occurs, the cost is already spent right mm. um and if you can have a discussion with someone and point out that especially if you're not at a blameless culture baseline yet if you can point out that you know the the incident occurred the cost is spent the point is to prevent future additional cost the the best way to do that is to make sure we deeply understand what happened and why and how um, so that we can take action to improve it and getting you know mad at people or um, any any sort of harsh retaliation about um, reporting when things go wrong is the best way to ensure that those costs will continue continue to happen right yeah um and it's I, I think again comes back to the the learning model, learning zone model, in that if you if you continually put your team in the panic zone, they will not learn. That's that's sort of like period. Yeah. yeah. If if you create discontent and anxiety, um, people aren't going to take from these opportunities and and turn them around and and change how they operate for next time so um I, I think it requires kind of coming to a common ground on the fact that people again do what they thought was best with what they knew at the time and really just taking that kind of humanist approach to yeah. to everything. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I've increasingly tried to start saying things are socio-technical because like technology does not happen or exist in a vacuum. Um, we we yeah. are all part of it. So um, it, it truly is a, truly needs to be a socio-technical approach. I think Emily in the chat is getting very excited because she's writing a blog post about this this week. <laughs> and won't be surprised if she wants to talk to you more. But I really like that framing uh, about cost. As you were saying that, I was thinking about it. It's almost as if when an incident happens, like you said, the cost will already happen. You've paid for something. You haven't received anything for that payment yet. If you, do a rev if you don't do a review, you, you, it's money you're throwing away. It's from the learning that at least the cost you've paid, you're getting something back for it, and and I really like that that framing that you uh, that you mentioned there. Um, 
So yeah, that's awesome. I wanna we have don't have a lot of time left, but is there are there maybe a couple of questions that if people want to come off mute and just ask something now is now is a good time for that. This is the time where we have the awkward silence and we just sit and wait for someone to say, I can't deal with it anymore. I'm gonna ask a question. So I'm gonna be quiet now and see if anyone has anything. Uh Emily wants to be your best friend. That is already something that's happening. <laughs> The first 10 seconds are the comfort zone. I know. I can't I can't deal with it. I can't I have to say words. Maybe what we can do is Dan, you can if people want to find you and connect with you, maybe tell us where they can do that. Um and, and we'll also send a follow-up email after this to give people uh information around that. But where do you hang out online? How can people reach you if they have additional questions? For sure. Um I'm pretty findable on LinkedIn. I'm the only person with my name as far as I know. Uh, I am at easy as python on the platform formerly known as twitter um that's that's probably the best way to get in touch with me uh, if you're in the learning from incidents slack i'm recently there as well um yeah happy to chat